in, and welcome to War Stories, behind-the-scenes tales from the front lines of the media. I am your host, Tom Curley. Welcome to the show. And we're just chugging along with more of our war stories. I was in the business uh, TV director for CBS for 40 years, and that's why we come up with all these stories. And, of course, I couldn't do it without my partner in crime, Mr. Gary Armstrong. Gary, how the hell are you today? Okay, except like many other people, we're living through a long, hot summer and trying to deal with that. But, you know, I've always been a hot weather guy. Um, so this, this, despite the uh, problems of the humidity, and you can hear summer frogs in my voice, I apologize for that. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. We were visiting old friends oh, earlier this week, and we were swapping parental memories and all that sort of thing. So it's a good day. I hope it's the same for you. Good, good. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, it's ridiculously hot outside, and I'm downstairs here in my little mm -hmm. basement studio where it's where it's really, really cool. Matter of fact, I come down here. I right. have to put on more clothes. So I am I am absolutely not <laughs> complaining. So before we start. Uh, I have a question that I got from uh, one of our viewers. I think our most loyal viewer, an old, old dear friend, uh, Alex Panzetta. And uh, he asked that picture behind you, behind your uh, mm -hmm. right ear. He said, who is the boxer in that picture? I think it's Marvin Hagler. Um, yes, so yes. Good, I've, good catch. Keep... Good catch. Okay. Yeah. Um, who is it? The the. The fellow to the right, um, it, it was Marvin Hagler because sadly we no longer have him with us. And the fellow to the left with the uh, white T-shirt on, who's no, no longer with us, uh, was my dad, who was a big, big boxing fan. He, um, he used to fight, fight um, as an amateur, uh, especially during World War II. And I remember a number of stories he told me that while... He was in the army, World War II, and he was over in Germany. And of course, at that time, the uh, services still had not been uh, integrated. So he had to deal with a lot of that among some really, really grisly wartime stories. But anyway, while he was over there uh, in his off time, which became kind of on time because he was uh, asked, and we'll say asked within qu uh, quotation marks, to show off some of his boxing abilities. So there's that. So he did do a little boxing, but being a big boxing fan, I fondly remember watching the uh, Gillette Friday night fights with uh, Don Dunphy. For anyone who's watching who was a boxing fan, that name will be familiar. So I ha got this idea sometime in the 80s, I think, Tom, what could I give my dad to put a smile on his face because he didn't do that a lot. And I can't blame him hardworking fellow. So I got a court officer who did um, sketches for us uh, in, during trials where you couldn't have cameras in the courtroom. And um, he volunteered with me asking to um, do, uh, do a sketch from video I have of Mar Marvin Hagler, who was a middleweight champion, I believe, and also a native son of Brockton, Massachusetts. And I got to know Marvin fairly well. So let's make this long story as short as we can. So the courtroom sketch artist did a, did a sketch of Marvin Hagler. I gave him a photo of my dad. And through this, this guy's artistry, he, he made up that, um, you call it a montage or a two-person picture or whatever, uh, of my dad and Marvin Hagler. Now, there weren't many things that really impressed my dad. When I went home to Long Island to visit one time, I, it might have been his birthday. I don't really remember. He said, what do you have in the package? And I, had, I said, I think you'll like this, Daddy. <clears throat> I unwrapped the package, and I showed him the picture. And Tom, I never saw my daddy smile the way he did. He was so happy with that. And he just looked at, at it for a moment. And he looked at me still smiling, and he said, Gary, thank you. And I felt like, man, I've finally done it. So that's that's that story. <laughs> My dad, he's up there somewhere. He's in the ring with Joe Lewis and all the other guys, and they're telling they're telling 
boxing war stories, probably. Oh, that's great. What a great story. That's awesome. Now, the, the closest I ever came yeah. was um, I did I did get Liberace's autograph for my mother and my mother-in-law. And uh, my mother-in-law uh, framed it. And I think my mother put it in a safe deposit box. Uh, but it was it was a cherished possession. It's nice when you can do when you can do nice nice stuff. Yeah, like that. when you can make your parents smile, when you can make them smile, because you, you know, you, I think we both have, uh, as sons, we both have memories of being told things like "Don't roll your eyes at me, Mister," or "Don't talk to me that way. I taught you better." But when you can get them to just genuinely <laughs> smile at an effort that you made, you you can't. This, you can't have a money equivalent of that. That was, that yes, that made my day. Oh, that's great. That's great. So onward, onward with this week. Um, what are we going to talk about this week? Uh, this one, I know we do a lot of celebrity things from this microphone, but this one is really is kind of a uh, what we do war story kind of thing. We had, and I'm, I'm going to not mention last names because I don't know who's around and who might take offense, and we always say this when we tell our stories. Um, we had a fellow, fellow reporter from another station, a competing station, he, and he was fairly capable. He was about five or ten years older than me, and this goes back, I believe, again to the early 80s. And um, he, this fellow had a habit of uh, standing as close as he could and listening to the other reporters as they did their stand-up closes where you wrap up all the events of your report. And for some reason, he he had a lack of confidence because he would steal, he would take the material you were using in your stand-up close, and then he would race over to his truck and his crew, and he would repeat it. And he would repeat all the information uh, in his stand-up clothes, and then he would claim that it was his material, that it, 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 it was his scoop. So one day we're wrapping up a story about, it was a crime, a murder or something like that, and they were looking for the suspects. So I did one take, good. We did a second for the crease, and I could see over my shoulder, I could see this guy standing behind a nearby tree, and even had his his hand cupping his ears the way people used to do when they couldn't hear. So I thought, what could I do to make the story legitimate enough so that he would buy it and yet throw him off at the end? Now, the police had not uh, released the names of the people they were looking for. Maybe they didn't know, but they were not releasing it to the media. So I got down to the end saying, this has happened and police are looking for so-and-so. Uh, and they told the public to be very careful. So when I got down to that part, I said, police definitely have identified two suspects, and uh, although they haven't released it to media, uh, my reliable suspects tell me that uh, we they know who the suspects are. One of them is Cody Jarrett. And he's uh, he's known to have mental problems, so the public should really be aware of Cody Jarrett. And the other one was Johnny Rocco. Well, listen, soldier, thousands of guys got guns, but there's only one Johnny Rocco. We do have, now I have, and I looked at my notebook, and uh, there was nothing on it, but I said, and I have some information which I can't reveal my source here, but uh, Johnny Rocco's last known residence was the Hotel Central in Milwaukee. Johnny Rocco and Cody Jarrett. And as far as we know, this station is the only one that has that information. Gary Armstrong, blah, 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 blah. And I signed off. And I could see the guy running just as I had given the names. He ran down, got his crew, and did his stand-ups and claimed them. His sources told them about Cody Jarrett. And Johnny Rocco. Well, listen, soldier. Thousands of guys got guns, but there's only one Johnny Rocco. And then they fed their piece into the station. As my guys were wrapping up their gear, I wandered down to the other truck. And this fellow was on the phone with his uh, 
on the two way with with his people back at his station, and I could hear them saying, "What, Johnny Rocco and Cody Jarrett?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah. These nobody else knows it. We can go with it. Let's 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 tease it. Let's tease it for the six o'clock show that we are the only ones that have it." And then the voice from the newsroom came back and said, "You know, you're a real doofus. Don't you know who Cody Jarrett and Johnny Rocco are?" And he said, yeah, they're the guys the cops are looking for. And then the boy says, hey, um, is Gary Armstrong in the story also? And I just started laughing. And he and he, he said, well, yeah, you know, Gary's a good friend. We swap in both. And he said, well, did Gary give you this information? He said, no, 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 no. I, I got it. I, I just I got it from my people. And then the other voice from the newsroom said, you're really stupid. Don't you know who those people are? And he said, yeah, the cops are looking for them. You can you can put that in the tease. And they said, no, those are th- movie characters. And he said, what? And they said, listen up. <laughs> Cody Jarrett is the character played by James Cagney in White Heat. And the guy's mouth starts to get bigger and bigger. <laughs> and he said, Johnny Rocco was Edward G. Robinson in Key Largo. Haven't you seen those movies? And the guy said, uh, uh, no, no. You mean Gary was making that up? He's going to go with that on TV? And they said, no, we don't think so. We don't even think Gary was rolling when he did that. And the guy said, no, I saw the camera looking at him. But did you know whether or not the camera actually had tape in it? And he said, no, but, you know, when Gary says something, you can take it from the horse's mouth. It's true. And that guy said, no, no, you've been had. Now go back and see if you can get some information that's valid and don't talk to Gary Armstrong. We repeat, don't talk to Gary. And the guy said, you know, son of a bitch, I thought Gary was a nice guy. And <laughs> that, that, that might be one of the best stories you've had so far. That, that, I, didn't, I never heard that before. That's fucking hilarious. <laughs> You know, you would think, you would think oh. most people, because both of these were, you know, well-known characters, and you can actually even do quotes from the, their movies, and I figured that had to be so obvious, but he he believed it, and he believed me, and his crew was laughing. The, they said as they were, they tried to warn him, and he blew them off, and they said, they said they were laughing at him and laughing at me that I had been able to pull that over him. So that was the last time he ever tried to, you know, steal something from me. That is a that you is a great that is a great way to do it. Wow. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I got I got I got nothing. Uh, that's even better than the scene in Anchorman where uh, they <laughs> find out that um, that that Ron will read anything that's put in the teleprompter. And, you know, and he says, good night and fuck you, San Diego. The entire Channel 4 News team, I'm Veronica Corningstone. And I'm Ron Burgundy. Go fuck yourself, San Diego. And has no knowledge that he even <laughs> said it. You know, you know, that's that that's more common. That's more common than you think. Yeah. What we used to do, what we used to do is um, uh, we used to try to put dummy stuff in the prompter all the time. But, you know, not live. Uh, when we were right. doing um, Market Watch, we would do these um, uh, these 90 second uh, uh, business pieces that would go out to all the affiliates, and then at the, at right. the end, uh, we would have to record um, special closes for whichever affiliate re- requested it. Say like you know, uh, Ed Crane. Uh, was one of our anchors. So he would have to record 20 or 30. I'm Ed Crane uh, for WBZ in Boston. And I'm Ed Crane for WKRP in Cincinnati. I'm Ed Crane. Right. And and as time went on, more and more stations would uh, would request that. So we'd have 30, 35, 40 of these we'd have to do every day because they right. changed their clothes. So we used to, I used to sneak stuff in the prompter that, you know, um, and for, for Channel 7 News, I'm Ed Crane. I'm Ed Crane, and I like cheese. I'm Ed Crane, and I'm not wearing any pants. <laughs> I'm, Ed, I'm Ed, you know, I'm Ed Crane, and I believe in UFOs. Just just 
silly, silly <laughs> stuff. And it, and and we could we could never throw him. He would always see it. We could never slip it by him. And it was you know it was being taped, so you know we weren't <clears throat> we weren't doing any damage or or any anything like that. So I, I have a question. Have you ever okay. uh, had a wanted to start a show or create a show or did the station decide that they wanted a show and the person high up decided that they wanted it and it happened like overnight? That ever happened where they come into you one day and say, Gary, we're going to do a show with such and such and you're going to be in it. There, yes, one time only, and I was sharing this with our friends when we visited the other day because we were watching the Cowboy Channel, which included uh, rodeo stuff, you know, bullback, uh, all that stuff. And uh, I said to um, our host, you know, I've done a lot of crazy things in my professional career, but I would never do any real rodeo writing because I could just see what it would do to your body and to a certain part of your body. So that that's always been a no-no to me. I mean, I love watching Westerns and rodeo stuff or whatever. That's what the station wanted me to do. This was after we had done that Walter Mitty series that involved the skydiving, working out with the Red Sox, uh, uh, piloting my own plane, uh, being a jockey at Suffolk Downs. So that was, that was a good cross section of uh, exciting things to do. But I always knew that as much as I love these cowboy movies, there was no way in heck you were going to get me on a wild stallion or on one of those crazy bulls. <clears throat> uh, I, I think the uh, powers that be challenged that. They wanted to, they, and they wanted to do it. So they said, Gary, <clears throat> we know you like Western, yada, 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 yada. We're going to do a show, and it's going to be almost as if you were covering the rodeo, but you'll be the subject matter. And that'll give it sort of a double nuance. And I said, it won't even be a single nuance because I'm not doing that. And I was thinking of what would happen if the horse or the bull lurched forward and I lurched forward. And even though I was wearing an athletic supporter, I just knew in my mind's eye what that would do to that part of my body. And I said, no, no way, no way. So... They said, well, you know, this could be a really big chance. And I said, I know, but I, I just, I can't do it. So they announced later that day, and it went to press the next day, that they were going to do a show about uh, rodeo riders in New England. And they got a freelance person to do it. And they shot one episode, and the guy got whacked uh, just where the family jewels were. And they never did another episode. And they came back and said, now you have to do it. We promoted it. We did one episode. And it was an unfortunate, solitary incident. And I said, you know what happens if a bull bucks you and you get whacked? And I said, you get whacked in your balls and your voice goes higher. Now, do you want me to be speaking like I'm a soprano? And they said, no, I, I guess not. And they went and tried it with another freelancer. And the same thing happened. So that was my answer to you, Kenya, your, your suggestion. Do you have something similar? Oh, yes. Well, <clears throat> not similar. All right. The, this has happened to me twice in my life. And depending upon the time, I will tell both stories. Um, I'm going to start okay. with the later one. Um, I started working okay. in the early 2000s. Uh, they created a, a website and a, a called CBS Market Watch. It was a um, it was a group venture that CBS owned part of, the Financial Times of London owned part of, and uh, a company called Market Watch went uh, owned part of, and it was originally a financial website, <clears throat> but they had a, a web page and they started doing videos. So we were doing uh, back then, you know, uh, video. The internet was still sort of new, uh, just coming into its own, yeah. and I pointed out to the uh, to the chairman uh, the the, the CEO, a cool guy named Larry Kramer, uh, one day came by and I had been doing the the uh, the website for uh, up to the minute. And I pointed out to him that, hey, you know, Larry, you can you can embed videos in your uh, in your website. And he went, oh, cool. 
do it. So we started doing that, and it began to generate a lot of income. <clears throat> so a couple of years go by, and the the CEO of CBS, I'll try to remember his name. Uh, it just doesn't come to me. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> one weekend, uh, the bells were chiming, the birds were singing. It could yes. have been a spring day. Who knows? <clears throat> he was. I watching, was wondering uh, whether it was you or me. Yes. Oh no, it's it's you. Um, he was watching a show on I think Fox called The Street dot com. Now The Street dot com was mm -hmm. another uh, uh, financial website, a competitor, and they had created a, a TV show, a little half hour, you know, weekend late you know business long form business reports so he calls up larry and says uh how come i don't have a show like that and larry says well you know uh sir we were actually developing a show like that and we had planned on right. taking it out to las vegas there's a there's a programming convention each year where everybody takes all their pilots and that's where they show off all the pilots of all the shows and try to sell right. them to the networks and to sponsors. And we, he said, well, we're going to take it out to Las Vegas and maybe pitch it. And he goes, no, I want it on the air in, on September 1st. And this was like July 31st. And oh, wow. so the next day they come, they come to me. <clears throat> and at the time we were doing these little news reports out of the old up to the minute studio which was still right. the up to the minute studio and he said we've got to create a, a show and we've got one month to do it i went okay so at the end of week <laughs> one all 10 cbs o and o's all cbs owned and operated stations had signed up for this show king's world had signed up to be the syndicator okay by the end of week <laughs> two we had a cup uh, like a hundred more affiliates because crap rolls downhill. So now we've got all these stations that are lined up. And the only thing we don't have is an actual show. So, and I'm directing it. So we, we, we ripped out the back half of what was the up to the minute interview set and put up a giant green screen. And we had a, our, our set designer who was into virtual reality at the time, created a whole set for us. And we went down and like just pioneered all this, this new technology and put this show together in one month. And it became, it was a show called CBS Market Watch Weekend. And it was a really good show. I mean, a really, really good show. Right. It was on Sunday mornings at, uh, uh -huh. uh, it was on after Face the Nation. Uh, it was on at 1030 after Face the Nation, and I think before uh, whatever came next. And it was a perfect Sunday show. They were It was like Sunday morning. They were long-form business right. reports, and we had this beautiful set that I was able to put do virtual remotes and also all sorts of cool stuff. And it, w it, sh it should be still on the air today. Um, it ended up being mm -hmm. broadcast all around the world. I, I saw it in it was it aired in the Middle East. I was down in Mexico and I saw it. It was everywhere. And it was a really popular show. And it would still be on the air today if it wasn't for the fact that um, CBS uh, uh, they Dow Jones bought CBS Market Watch. okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then uh, Dow Jones, was then bought by Fox News. So it became Dow so so CBS Market Watch the first thing they did is say, well we don't need the CBS part. And then the second thing they yeah. did was they had a contract with with CNBC who had the right of first refusal for any show that Dow Jones did and they wanted nothing to do right. with it because it was CBS Market Watch weekend. So they canceled the show, which was which was really really sad. But what was fascinating yeah. about it was how th that, you know, if the big guy wants something, it happens immediately. And now the other, right. the other even, the other even crazier story about that uh, is the creation of the overnight news show called Up to the Minute, 
which I was one of the founding Ooh. fathers of. And, and it is a right. fascinating story. Yet another story where the president of news decided that they were going to do this and they did it. And that is a really cool story, which we will get to next week because we did it again. We have run out of time. So anyway, on to the, on to the plugs. Let's see how quickly we can get through them. Um, Seeking Intelligence Life on Earth, <laughs> Serendipity, the blog that Marilyn and you and I all contribute to. Uh, Voice Games Audio Theater for the best in audio, comedy, and drama. Uh, Half Hour Radio Show, the cult hit from the radio uh, past in the 80s is back. And of course, my sister podcast, Get Off My Lawn with me, Tom Curley, where we talk about life, the universe, and whatever the fuck I want to talk about. <sighs> so I guess that's it. <laughs> So That's we'll it. we'll see you next. <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs> Sayonara. <laughs>